worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together. Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together. Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together.
Always good to see you today, every day, every Sunday. Glad you're here. It's always a, a blessed privilege to assemble together and worship our God. He deserves to be praised, is worthy to be praised, and, um, and has invited us into his presence to do that very thing. And so it's an honor uh, for us to honor him. And we'll begin this period of worship with a reading from his word. And uh, Hutt is going to be reading to us this morning. David's leading our singing. Let's all turn to Psalms 139. We'll read the first 16 verses of that chapter. In Psalms 139, it says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down, and you and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me from behind and before, and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is high, I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You covered, my, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well, my frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Good morning. We'll begin with O oh, Worship the King. And I sneaked in a, a extra stanza of this, so that'll be, uh, that'll be coming up. We've sung before. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
next song I believe is new to us. It's written by uh, Brother Max Wheeler. I think I think Brother Chuck knows knows him. Go ahead. <clears throat> For our opening prayer, we'll sing, O oh God, our help in ages past. Let's pray together. Our mighty God and Father, it is a privilege to worship you this morning. We're so thankful to come before your throne and lift up our voices in praise to your great and awesome name. Thank you, Father, for loving us, for blessing us and redeeming us. Thank you for bringing us together as your people, that we may proclaim your praises, that we may live in the light, and always point others to your glory. Thank you, Father, for sharing 
yourself with us, for revealing yourself through your word. We pray, Father, that in all things we do, our hearts would draw nearer to you this morning, that we would be open to your word as it is proclaimed, that we would willingly lift up our voices and give of all we have to give you the honor that is due. We thank you, Father, for your care for us, for all of our needs on this earth. We know, Father, that we are poor. At times we are troubled, but we know of your power. We know your faithfulness. We know that you love us more than we can imagine. We pray, Father, that all things we do would love you in return. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for the life that he lived for us, the death and the resurrection. We thank you for the hope we have through him. We pray, Father, that we would be shaped each day into his image and that as we interact with each other, as we go out into the world, that others would see Christ in us. Thank you, Father, for the hope of heaven, for a chance, for an opportunity, for life beyond this world with its troubles, with its sin, with its temptations. Pray, Father, that you would draw us nearer today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll sing this song before the lesson, and if it's convenient, would you please stand with me? Before the lesson, we're going to look at Acts 17, and we'll be reading verses 30 and 31. In Acts 17, it says, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance to all. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Today we have uh, 
come to the end of this series of lessons that we began quite a few weeks ago called What is Man? We haven't uh, exhausted the topic uh, by any means, but I hope that it has been for you a profitable study. Uh, it has been for me in putting the lessons together. Hopefully it has been for you. And we'll say a little bit uh, at one point in our lesson today, uh, just by way of quick review of some of the things that we've talked about in this series. But as we come to this last lesson today, here is the final answer that we're giving to this question. What is man? Well, we are destined for judgment. That's who we are. We are beings that will one day stand before our Creator to be judged. And we're going to look at a text this morning that, uh, that paints a very striking picture of that judgment. In Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse number 11, John gives us an account there of something that he saw. And really, that's the whole background to the book of Revelation. It was a series of, of things that John was privileged to see. It was as if John was, was seated in a theater, and up in front of him on a stage was a series of events, people, things, that he saw. And at the beginning of the letter, he was told, John, what you see, write in a book. Revelation 1, verse 11. And send it to the seven churches that are in Asia. And so he did exactly that. He watched what God portrayed on the stage in front of him and then wrote down a description of what he saw. There are times when he explains what he saw where God gives him, shows him something in that great drama, and then it's explained to him what it means. Most of the time, he doesn't do that. The images are described, but the explanation is not given. And what we have in chapter 20 is, again, another of those scenes that was played out before John's eyes, that he gives a written verbal description of. Here's what he saw. Revelation 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. In Matthew 25, verse 31, the Bible says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory... He will sit on His glorious throne. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. And so as these visions that John saw were nearing their end, this is what he saw. God showed him a throne and the one seated upon it. We know from other passages that this is representative of the Lord, the one who would come in His glory and sit on His glorious throne, the one according to Paul in Acts 17, verse 30 and 31, the one through whom God will judge the world, the one that He raised from the dead. And in verse 12, John continues by saying, here's something else I saw. I saw the dead great and small, standing before the throne. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. Do not marvel at this. 
For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves shall hear his voice and come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. John 5, 28 and 29. John was privileged to see that, a depiction of that. And then in verse 12, he says, And not only did I see the dead, small and great, standing before the throne, but I also saw this. Books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Isn't that an interesting picture that John describes? Books were opened. doesn't say how many books. And then another was opened in addition to those books. And what these books represent is of tremendous significance. Because your eternal destiny and mine will be based on what's written in those books. And so if we would truly understand who we are, we cannot refuse to look forward to that day when these books are going to be opened. And so we're going to spend just a few minutes today talking about those books. And we'll start with one of the books that's going to be open on that day that's called in Scripture the Book of Life. John mentions it in our text to Revelation 20, verse 12. Books were opened, then another book was opened, which is the Book of Life. We'll call this God's book in God's hands. We don't touch this book. This is God's book, and He's in control of it. We might call this or refer to this as God's family record. I don't know how often this happens today, but it was a a practice I know many years ago, generations ago, that families would have their own Bible, a family Bible. And in that family Bible would be listed the names of the members of the family and, and their dates of birth. There might be pages in there for marriages and, and things of that nature. And, and it, was a, it was a family record. A, a pages were dedicated in the copy of God's Word for family information, family records. Well, that seems to be similar to what is being described in Scripture as this book of life. It's God's family record. In it are contained the names of God's children. Paul references it in Philippians 4, verse 3, when he speaks of fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. In Luke chapter 10, after Jesus had sent his apostles out uh, on uh, what we refer to as the limited commission, they come back and report to him all that they were able to do, and they were astonished and amazed at the miraculous abilities that they had and casting out demons and things of that sort. And Jesus gave them this warning in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, don't rejoice in those things. Rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now, what those passages tell us is that there is in existence, again, as Scripture uses this language and terminology to communicate these concepts, that God has a record of His children. 
wherein are written their names. Which leads us then to the question, is your name written there? Well, it is when you obey the gospel. When you become one of God's chosen ones, when you become one of His children by means of recreation, as God gives you spiritual life, your name is written in His book. And it will remain there as long as you are His devoted disciple. The name can be removed. Now, there are some folks uh, that, that don't believe that's true, that once your name is written there, that it can't be removed, but Scripture says otherwise. In Exodus 32, verse 33, God says, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now that's a very straightforward statement that indicates, yes, your name can be blotted out of that book. In Revelation 3, verse 5, Jesus said, Those who overcome will not have their names blotted out of his book. Which implies that some will have their names blotted out. And so your name can be written there, is written there when you obey the gospel, but if we decide at some point we're going to turn our backs on the Lord and go back to the world, that name will be blotted out. So ask yourself the question, do I know that my name is written there? The book of life, God's book in God's hands. Another book's going to be open that day. We'll call it the book of books. This is God's book in man's hands. We're talking about this book. The book given to us to guide us in this life, to prepare us for that final day of judgment. God has given us His book. It's His, but He's placed it in our hands for us to read, for us to study, for us to use to come to better understand Him, who He is, what He's done for us, how He would have us respond to what He's done for us. This book placed in our hands provides for us the answers to the most critical and fundamental questions of life. It is that book that answers the question, what is man? That we've been studying in this series of lessons. That book answers questions like, where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? No other book answers those questions. And as we thought about that question, that central question of our series, what is man? Who are we? We did the best we could to open up this book and allow it to answer that question, to tell us who we are. And it tells us, as we studied in the series, that we are here by means of special creation. We are created beings. That God created us in His own image, Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. And we had a lesson on that, that we bear the image of God. And we studied at least what we could about what that phrase means. And what it means for us on a practical level to bear the image of our Creator. We looked in the book of books to answer the question about who we are by looking at the fact that we are dual creatures. In the sense that we are both body and spirit. We're not body only. We're not spirit only. We're composed of both body and spirit. We looked into the book of books and saw that we exist for the purpose of seeking God. Acts 17, verse 27. That we exist for the purpose of glorifying and honoring God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. Whatever we do, we should do it 
to bring honor and glory to God. We saw in the book of books that we are fallen creatures. But even though we're fallen creatures, we're not unloved creatures. God loves us. And has revealed to us that we will spend eternity in one of two places. And this book reveals God's plan to save us from the guilt of our sins. Through Jesus. The greatest expression of His love. He tasted of death for every man. Hebrews 2 verse 9. God commends His love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 8. And that gospel, that good news of Jesus is God's power to save. Romans 1, 16. And Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all that obey him. Hebrews 5, verse 9. That's what the book of books reveals about who we are. And as we learn in Scripture, we're going to be judged by that book. Jesus said, the words that I have spoken... They shall judge you in the last day. John 12, 48. That's why we do what we can, the best we can, to teach this book, to emphasize this book, to encourage us to spend time with God in that book, <clears throat> because that book will meet us in judgment. What did John see? He saw a throne, one seated on it. He saw the dead, small and great, standing before the throne. And he saw books opened. The book of life. The book of books. And this book. The book of deeds, the book of works. We'll call this man's book in man's hands. This is our book. This is the book we write in. God keeps the ledger on the book of life. God has been responsible for giving us the book of books, but we're the ones who write in this book. Man's book in man's hands. This is the journal of our lives. And you have one of these books. So do I. You have written in that book this week. You have written in that book this very day. In this book are recorded our actions, works, deeds, our words, even our thoughts. This book will be opened that day. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in the body, to receive reward for the things done in the body according to what we have done, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or bad. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14. Is that not a sobering thought? We walk through life a lot of times on autopilot. We have our routines. Perhaps we get up at the same time every day and, and we, we go through our morning routine and we go to work and we do, you know, we... we we simply live, we exist, we go through the, the daily motions and activities. How often, though, in the process of doing that, are we remembering that with each thing we do, with each thing we think, with each word we say, a record is being kept. In Revelation 20, verse 12, John said the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. 
The record is being kept. And while that is a sobering thought, and while it can be in some ways a frightening thought, the good news is that things can be removed from this book too. It's a frightening thought to think about the fact that names in the book of life can be blotted out. That's not an enjoyable thing to think about. But things that we have done, said, and thought recorded in our book of deeds can also be blotted out. David prayed for that in Psalm 51, verse 1. According to your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. He asked again in verse 9 of the same psalm. Blot out my transgressions. As we come to the Lord in penitence, and as we recognize the fact that we have sinned, that we do sin, that we're not perfect, and we understand our need for God, our need for the blood of Christ, and we come penitently before Him, God blots things out. Their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews 8, 8 through 12. And all of this works together, all of these books work together this way. Whether or not my name is in the book of life will be determined by whether or not my book of deeds conforms to the book of books. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Nothing unclean will enter it, the heavenly home, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Once those books are opened on that final day, there will be no opportunity then to change your state. No invitation songs on that day. The mercy of God grants you and me this life this time to choose where we will spend eternity. Thanks be to God that he has not left us to guess about any of this, that he's loved us enough to tell us, to reveal his will to us, and to tell us, here's what's going to happen, and here's who you are. You are a being destined for judgment. Live like it. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you have done so much to save us from the guilt of our own sin. We thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus, that he paid the penalty, suffered the punishment for our sins. We pray, Father, that In response to that, we would give ourselves, the totality of ourselves, to you. We pray, Father, that as we consider who we are as products of your creation, as recipients of your love, that we would live our lives each day seeking you, honoring you, glorifying you. We pray, Father, that as we live from one day to the next, we'll not lose sight of the fact that we will stand before our Savior, your Son, our Judge. We thank you, Father, that we can look forward to that day with anticipation and hope not because of who we are 
in ourselves, but because of who He is and all that He's done for us. We ask, Father, today that you would hear our prayer and accept our thanks. In the name of Jesus, amen. Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together. Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together. Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together.
Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together. Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together. Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together.
Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together. Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together. Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together.
careful. Good morning. Hopefully everyone's having a good day today. Certainly good to be back with you again this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, let's open up our Bibles uh, to the book of Hebrews. And we want to look at Hebrews in chapter 8 as we begin this morning. Kind of an eclectic topic this morning. Uh, might be going a little bit all over the place in the scriptures. And if you if you have questions or if you have comments, feel free to speak out at any time. And uh, if you totally derail me and and we go off in another direction, I don't care. <laughs> That's just fine. You know, if we're talking about the Bible and we're talking about things you want to to talk about, then that's that's a good class for me. I was uh, I started to say watching TV, and that's not accurate really anymore. I mean, I guess technically it, it is on the television, but it's connected to an Apple TV, and it's connected back to YouTube servers that are owned by Google, and so I'm watching YouTube. And uh, I caught a little video of Neil deGrasse Tyson. Do you all know who he is? He's a real famous astrophysicist, and he's kind of the, well, I hate to even say it like this, but it's kind of true. He's kind of the latest flavor of the month uh, in bashing the Bible. You know, there's, there's been these guys for, for generations who, who seem to make a name for themselves of, of going along and, and uh, you know, bringing up something that, where the Bible is just wrong. It's just wrong. And, uh, you know, those Christians over there, they're nice people. Just, just leave them alone. They won't hurt anybody if you, if you don't poke them too hard. And... Uh, but, you know, they're, they're, just, they're just misinformed. And if they would just read and think, well, you know, then they'd become scientists like us and they would be atheist and agnostic and then everybody would get along well and the world would be a great place. And, you know, it's the same story over and over again with these guys. <clears throat> and, you know, the thing that caught my attention is he was talking about how that, because he's an astrophysicist, he studies stars in great detail. And the stars that God has made up in the heavens, uh, they are amazing. You know, there are some stars that are so large, it would take you over a thousand years to go around them one time. Could you imagine that? You know, if you lived a hundred years, that's a long time. But if you had to live ten of those lifetimes, so you can go around this star once. That's not even the largest one that he's made. Whenever you think about the hundreds of billions of stars, hundreds of billions of galaxies, <laughs> we, we have approximately between 100 and 200 billion stars in each one. God says that he has a name for each one of them, and he calls them all by name. And at the same time, he says that he holds all the stars in the palm of his hand. So <clears throat> whenever Mr. Tyson made this comment, I thought it was... It was uh, Sad, but it was also something that, you know, is kind of typical for, for the world. And the fact that he was talking about over in the book of Revelation, and it's just interesting that, you know, Brother Eddie was talking about Revelation this morning. He was talking about that there's a, a third of the stars in heaven that will fall to the earth. And if you look in, in the scripture, that's true. There are several places that it, that it does say this. And he uses this to, to speak to his classes and to speak to his audiences and say, see, well, the, the people were just ignorant of the, the things of science back then, and they didn't know anything about stars. So they made statements like this, but if they'd have really known about stars and what they really are, and uh, if there really was a God, that's the implication, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't make these kind of mistakes. What's the first thing that, that we see in the book of Revelation? Evidently, Mr. Tyson missed. And I told you, let's, let's start off in, in Hebrews chapter 8. And let's, let's, probably we need to start off 
in the way that I'm going this morning, let's start off in Revelation chapter 1. And then we'll get back over into chapter 8 in Hebrews and just kind of go along with what I'm, what I'm looking at. And if you haven't guessed it already, it's how to properly interpret the Scripture, how to properly understand the Scripture, and how that, you know, it doesn't take a Solomon to see. <laughs> that, that God is using different types of language to get his message across to us. And that if a person is willing... He can have all the information that God can give him and more. So he starts off and he says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and those who keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now the angel, it says here, he was sent, and he did what? He signified it to his servant John. Now you see it in the word, signified. What's the, the first part of that? What's the root? These are signs. The book of Revelation, for the people that received it for the first time and for us today, it was never meant to be something that was literal. Satan's not being kept in a literal prison for a literal thousand years. <laughs> and there, there's things that he's talking about there that those people who read the book the first time, they would understand. They would understand and they would know. And it takes a little bit more work for us because we didn't live in the first century, but we can understand them. And we can know them. And whenever God says that there's a third of stars that we're going to fall out of the skies and we're going to come down to earth, guess what? Mr. Tyson needs to know this too. <laughs> Hopefully he'll, he'll learn it. God's not talking about the physical stars of the heavens. Now he tells us what's going to happen to the physical stars in, in the end. But he doesn't say that they're going to fall to heaven or fall out of heaven to, to the earth. This is a sign. Just like many other things that he says, you know, whenever he talks about, you know, uh, different uh, things that would happen, different plagues, they were all different signs that John would understand. The readers of the, that book the first time, they would understand. And so there's, a, there's an expectation that God wants us to understand his book and that we have to look at it more than just a, a you know, a passing glance of just, well, this is what's wrong with it. You know, there was a, a man that used to tour the country giving a talk called The Mistakes of Moses. You know, there again, over and over again. Whenever you go back and you look at these, it's interesting to me because if you just take basic biblical interpretation and, and what God says in his word, you start to see where these guys, you know, they start falling apart. They don't understand figures of speech. They don't understand how that... God sometimes will say things very literally, but then other times he says things just very uh, picturesque in the same way that we talk all the time ourselves, day in and day out. So notice what, let's get back over to the book of, uh, of Hebrews and let's look at Hebrews in chapter 8. Notice what he says there whenever he's talking about the covenants. And we touched on this before, and, and y'all have heard sermons on this many times before I know because... I guess really the churches of Christ are, are probably one of the few places that I've been, and I've, I've visited many. I've visited many different uh, groups, you know, whenever I was growing up and, and through life, and sometimes we have friends and family that will invite us to different uh, functions that they have, and I always, I always like to attend just to kind of see things firsthand for myself. And one of the things that I see a lot of times, and this is where people sometimes they they're mistaken. They're honestly mistaken, but they're mistaken. And the fact that they, they mix up the fact that there's a first covenant and there's a second covenant. You know, they don't get that part straight. And so whenever they see something in the Old Testament and they see that David was praising God with instrumental music, they think, well, it's okay for us to do it today. Now, if that's true, let's do it. But if it's not, <laughs> we shouldn't do it, right? And we need to look at these things and, and see. And so here is a great place to show people 
that there's more than one covenant that's being spoken of. And there's actually more than just the, these two. There was another covenant, but it was before the covenant of Moses. But anyway, here's the two that we have that are in focus for us in the book of Hebrews. And he says, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for what? A second. <laughs> so it's just as easy as that. If we just took that one, one scripture, we can show that there's more than one. You know, God doesn't have the same covenant for everyone. He doesn't have the same covenant for Noah that he had for me. He just doesn't. I mean, there's, there's nowhere that God is expecting me to build an ark and to start, you know, opening it up for, for people to, to come in and, and to be saved. Now over in Kentucky, there's a, a replica of the ark that's being made, and I think that's a great thing. You know, I would, I would love to go see it. I'm, I'm planning on, on taking Sherry down there sometime. She's been wanting to go for a while, and, and just to see the, the magnitude of it and the, the impressiveness of the size, uh, I think would be a, a good thing. But what's that now? It's worth it. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I knew I heard someone. So, yeah, anybody that's been, if, if you liked it, yeah, you know, uh, hit me up and tell me a little bit more about it because uh, it looks interesting online. And to, to be in, you know, uh, a ship of that size, I think, is, is certainly interesting. But that's not what God is, is using for salvation today. He's told us that he destroyed the world once by water, but he's not going to destroy the world again by water. So he says... Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I have made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For I, or excuse me, it says, for this covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, I will... Uh, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, Know the Lord, for all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. And then he says the new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So you might already have, have seen this, you might already know this, but if you look in the center column reference of your Bible, you probably see that there's a reference back to the book of Jeremiah. So this is something that God said to the prophet Jeremiah a long time ago. And he's telling Jeremiah, I'm not going to keep the same covenant with the people that I did whenever I took them out of Egypt. You would think that the people of Jesus' time would have seen that, that they would have known that. They would have been looking for, for that new covenant. But they were so wrapped up in what they had in Abraham and Moses that they didn't want anything else. We don't need anything else. Is that true? It's not, is it? Moses was a great man. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there's, there's things that uh, it, it just it, it boggles my mind how good he was and how, uh, you know, resourceful he was at, at times. And then there were times in which, you know, he was scared of his own shadow. He didn't want to do this and he didn't want to do that. And then there were other times where he would lose his temper and he would get mad and he would do things that most men would not do. But then there were other times in which he was great. And he was exactly the person that God needed him to be. Yeah, he was very human. That's a good way to put it. That is an excellent way to put it. And uh, he, he made the mistakes that, that all of us make. You know, was it, uh, was it that Moses was a perfect man or Abraham was a perfect man? We know that that's not true. And whenever uh, we're looking at you know, what do we need? What do they need as somebody who can stand before God in sinless, perfect, absolute perfection and plead on my behalf? Do I want Abraham? Do I want Moses? Or do I want Jesus? That's the question that, that's being discussed here in the book of Hebrews. 
And the Hebrew writer keeps coming back all the time. Same answer. You want Jesus. That's the man that you want. That's the God that you want. And he is the one that is, is perfect and without fault. And so God says there's coming a day in which, he doesn't name him by name, but he's going to make a covenant through this man Jesus. And he is going to have a house that is going to be established forever. Even, you know, I think it's interesting too, like in the book of Daniel, we see hints of this in Daniel in the chapter 2. Because Nebuchadnezzar was having these dreams, and we all know the stories there. Uh, you know, his sleep left him at night. He couldn't sleep. If you've ever had those sleepless nights where you just can't get any rest, this is how he was doing. And he wanted his, his magicians to tell him what was going on. And uh, they, weren't, they weren't doing a very good job of it. They couldn't tell him the dream. He couldn't remember the dream. And so off came their heads, and they were starting to get executed. And uh, then comes along Daniel. And he not only tells him the dream, but he gives him the interpretation. And you remember in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, what is the last thing that that we see about the kingdom which God is going to establish? Never be destroyed. It's not going to come to an end. It's not going to be given over to another people. It is a kingdom that will last forever. And so, you know, I say all of that, and I'm kind of, you know, going the long way around, as my dad would say, to get to this point. There's something interesting that God says here. Look down in verse 10. He says, in those days, he says, I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write them in their hearts. Now, is that true or false? It's true. Obviously, it's true. Is it literal or is it not? That's kind of a trick question because for some people it was literal. But what about for us today? Does God literally write his laws in our minds? Does he write them in our hearts? We should know them, yes. Right, we, absolutely. No, I, I, I totally agree. We should know them. Uh, we, we should have them there. And what I wanted to look at is, is how is it that it gets there? You know, and that's part of the reason that, that we have some of the problems that we have out in the world today. Just like the instrumental music question. I've, I've sat down with people and, and talked with them, and they told me straight to my face, you know, God is telling me this. And I have to hold my tongue sometimes because I want them to start writing, you know, the next Revelation book two. <laughs> it's like this, this did literally happen for a select few. There were people whom the Holy Spirit was given to that they knew exactly what God wanted them to know. They didn't have to have a teacher. They didn't have to have someone standing up and, and giving a class like what we have now. They received that information directly from the Holy Spirit. Now, who were those people? The, the, the first group, if you will. They were the apostles. They were the ones that Jesus chose. You know, it's... Uh, Serious business, you know, whenever a man decides that he doesn't want to sleep, but he wants to go out and he wants to pray all night long because of an important decision that he's going to make the next morning. Now, that's, that's probably a few times that, you know, I can think of in my life where, you know, things were that bad where you're losing sleep that you're praying and, and praying all night. And it wasn't that it was bad, but it was just important. And he was going to choose who his apostles were going to be. And then we have, uh, of course, Judas who fell from his apostleship. Uh, Matthias was uh, numbered with the twelve. And then we have the apostle Paul that was one that was born out of due season. He uh, was uh, on the road to Damascus, was uh, not looking for the gospel, but uh, found the gospel. And was not looking for the Lord, but found the Lord. And he uh, chose him as a chosen vessel. So did the Lord... uh, write his law on their minds yes did he write them on his on their hearts absolutely and there were a few others that we can we can see in scripture as well what about mark john mark was he an apostle or dr luke 
They weren't, were they? They weren't apostles. But they were people that the apostles laid their hands on. And we do see miraculous gifts being delivered from one person to another through the laying on of hands. And so God has given a gift to the Holy Spirit that has went to the apostle, that's went to John Mark. Now you see where we're, we're kind of heading in this direction. Keep that in mind, that it wasn't something that John Mark went to God and said, I need this, and, and we have it. There's a lot of people that are out there today that they're, they're wanting to have a relationship with God, but they're not going to accept God's relationship on his terms. You know, if you come to me and you tell me, if you make me aware somehow, some way that, that you're real, well, then I'll believe in you, and I'll, I'll be your servant for life. He's done that but just wasn't the way that they wanted. And so sometimes we have to show people that it didn't happen for a lot of people that way, even people that we see in the scriptures. And we're, we're no different. And so whenever we, we say we want to have a relationship with God, it absolutely has to be on God's terms. My will in the matter doesn't have anything to do with it. God's not taking me into consideration whenever he decides whether... He wants to, to have a relationship with me in and of the plan, you know. But then whenever it comes into our will, that's whether we're going to submit to God's plan or not. You know, if we're going to, to take on what God has given to us. Let me ask you this. Um, this is really a dark topic, and, and sometimes I hate talking about it because it's just so, just so evil what, what David did. But again, another great man. Whenever you look at somebody that, that God talks about in, in a glowing manner, King David is one of them. You know, he says he's a man after my own heart. But then whenever he, he finds Bathsheba and, and uh, oh, she's already married. I don't care. And he goes after her. And there's this one guy that's standing in the way. And uh, it's her husband. And, and what kind of man is her husband? What's that? He is. He's honorable. And he is uh, a loyal servant of the king. He is in his armies. He's a fighter. Uh, there's loyalty that's on the football field. And there's loyalty that's on the, the basketball court. <laughs> but you won't find loyalty like you find on the battlefield. Whenever you've got somebody beside you that will keep you alive so you can go home to your fa friends and family... You know, that changes you. That's, that's a different type of loyalty. That is uh, a brotherhood that uh, God wants us to have. And I think that he had. <clears throat> but David didn't. And so, whenever Nathan the prophet, he, uh, he comes to him and he tells him that story about, you know, the little ewe lamb that was, that was there and was the only one that this person had. And his rich neighbor come and he killed it and and used it uh, for basically for slaughter, and it just infuriated the king. It didn't take him long to realize, after Nathan pointed at him and said, you're the man, to realize that this is exactly what he had done. Now he says something interesting there, we don't take time to read it this morning because I'm, I'm already going way over on what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> but he says, you killed him. You killed Uriah. Now, did David kill him? Was David the one that put the sword in him and, and ended his life? Not literally, but he sent word back to the commanders by your eyes on hand, which is even something is more evil. Uh, get him into the heat of battle. Get him in the front and then leave him there. Can't imagine doing something like that to someone. But he did, and he is the one that God holds responsible. So all of that, now I, I get, get off on a rabbit trail if, if I'm not careful, if y'all let me. But uh, you know what I want to look at is the subject of agency. Even Uriah himself was an agent in this. And, you know, what about... Um, the commanders, whenever they read it, did they know if that was right or wrong to do? Absolutely, they knew that was wrong. Would they want that done to them? Absolutely not. 
and it goes it goes beyond and, and so far away from what they you know what they teach you in those those types of situations about how that you're there for your brother and that you're you got his back because he's got yours and they put him in a place where nobody had him nobody had his back and they just let him be killed they let him die so absolutely he knew that was wrong but Nathan says that you're the man you're the one that killed him and so you know God uses this, and he uses the examples like this. I'll say it this way, in a roundabout way. <laughs> you might not think that he's a perfect example of agency, but it seems to fit. And the fact that, you know, there are things that happen, and it, it has different hops. You know, there's, there's different places where that, that hits, and it goes from here to here to here, and then finally it reaches the place that it's supposed to go. And so the Lord says here, he says, I'll put my laws... And uh, in your mind, and I will write them on your heart. So we've we've got where the Holy Spirit. And let's let's look at this. Um, I believe it's John. Let me look here at my reading history. I was looking up some of these scriptures earlier earlier today. Let's go to John 16. Let's look there at verse 20. That's not it. Sorry. I have to get better notes. Okay, let's look here at John 16 and verse 5. I'll get to the right place here in a second. Now it says, Now I go away to, to him who sent me. This is Jesus is talking. And none of, none of you ask me, Where are you going? But because I have said these things, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. And if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him. It says, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment and of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the rule of the world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. He will take of what, is, what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I have said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So here, here again, we see that chain. We see God the Father has given things to the Son. And then whenever he leaves, he's going to give them here to this one that is called the Helper, the Holy Spirit. He says whenever he goes back to the Father, the Holy Spirit is going to come here. He's going to come here to the earth. And then he's going to take of these things which are the God the Father's, that are Christ's. And I would even say that they're his. Even though specifically he says not only of his own authority. So these are things that have not originated with the Holy Spirit, but they've originated with the Father. And he says whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you of things to come. So many other things, he says. Did, did he share everything with the apostles whenever he was here on the earth with them? And the answer is no. So he gives these things to the Holy Spirit. And there are people today still that are, that are thinking that this means that the Holy Spirit is going to speak directly to me. And if he doesn't speak to me, and if I don't speak in tongues as a evidence of that, then that means I'm really not saved. But whenever we look here at subjects like agency, and we look here at how God works, and we see examples of how he works, how is it that he's working here in the first century? Did he go and speak with everybody directly? Even in the first century in the church? He didn't, did he? There were times, let's go over into the, the book of Acts. Uh, let's go to Acts. 
I want to look there at Acts in chapter 8. Now Saul was, he was still being a bad person at this time. And you can see that in the very beginning of uh, chapter 8 down to about verse 3. He's still making havoc of the church, the Bible says, entering the houses, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Uh, just was, was doing a lot of, a lot of terrible things. And it says, therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. And then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord, he did the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed, and lame, and were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Then we read the, the story about uh, Simon, the sorcerer, and, and uh, uh, how that uh, he wanted to buy the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. But what I wanted to, to get to is this. Was Philip an apostle? He was not, right? He was somebody who was an evangelist, whom evidently, because of the miracles that he did, the apostles had laid their hands on. So again, God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, one of the apostles, and then Philip, and he's doing these miraculous deeds, and we have many people that are, are coming to Christ. But there's something that... Um, has not happened yet. Something that, that Philip is not able to do. Look at verse 14. It says, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they may do what? Receive the Holy Spirit. Now that's a... Again, a picturesque way of saying that they might receive miraculous gifts. Now, we know that to be the, the truth because just read a little bit further. It says, For as yet he had fallen on none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then look at verse 17. Now, why didn't Philip just lay hands on these people? He couldn't do it, could he? Because he wasn't an apostle. Now, who was an apostle here in, in this particular passage of scripture, Peter and John. And they said, Peter and John. And they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now Simon, he saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of hands. And what did he do? He, you know, we won't spend a lot of time on this this morning, I don't, I don't believe, but it's just interesting to me that he caught on to this just like that. <laughs> he wanted, he said, I want to do this too. And in fact, I've got a lot of money and I'll be willing to, to pay for it. And then that just tore Peter up. He says, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this manner for your heart is not right before the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your what? Wickedness. And pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Now he's saying this to someone who was just baptized, who was a Christian. So he's, he's got a lot of learning to do, but still Peter was not happy that he thought that this gift could be purchased with money. And Simon makes the right, the right response here. He looks at Peter and, and he answers and says, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord... They returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now, it's interesting that uh, the apostles, before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, they didn't even want to go to Samaria, did they? They didn't really care about being there. <laughs> in fact, it was, it was something that was, uh, in their culture, was, was forbidden. And now they're, they're very happy that the Samaritans are receiving the gospel. So, again... We have God, the Father. He's delivered this to Jesus Christ. He's delivered it to the Holy Spirit. He's delivered it to Peter and John in this example. And we have another man that is an evangelist that is preaching the gospel. 
And then if they're going to receive miraculous gifts, why would they receive miraculous gifts? Y'all help me out. Why would they need that? Okay, so everybody tells the truth, right? I know, that's, that, that, you're on the right track. You're exactly right. People lie, and sometimes they don't, they don't mean to lie. You know, sometimes we give them the benefit of the doubt, and they, they're just telling something that's not true, or they think it's true, but it's not. Other times people will look you in the face, and they will just lie to you. They will tell you that they are an apostle, you need to believe me. You need to listen to me. Uh, we read about one man uh, that was of that persuasion in the scriptures. Uh, was it Diotrephes? That uh, he wanted to be the one that was preeminent in the church. You listen to me. And he didn't want them to even listen to the apostles whenever they came to town. And so there's people like that out there in the world today. Now, this is the point that I was, you know, I was working towards is this. They didn't have all of the written word. Now, they might have Old Testament scrolls that they would have at the synagogue, and there would be pieces of these things, uh, the scrolls that they would write down that uh, we refer to as lectionaries today. You see that from Old Testament scripts, and then you see this from New Testament scripts as well. Uh, people just didn't have... Uh, Genesis through, through Malachi in their back pocket, <laughs> like what you can today. Uh, they didn't have all of the New Testament. All of the New Testament had not been given. Paul, later on, whenever he's speaking about this matter, he says, we look through a glass dimly. He says, that's now. But he says, when that which is perfect is come, he says, we're going to be able to see clearly face to face. He talks about how the church was like a little child, and Paul says whenever he was a child, he behaved like a child, he thought like a child, but whenever he became a man, what? He put away childish things. Now, it's, it's interesting to me that whenever we look at the context, whenever we look at this very picturesque way, again, of, of childish things, what is God talking about the childish things? He is. He's talking about miraculous gifts, the one thing that everybody wants. You know, they want to be able to do miracles, and God says, no, that's, that's for babies. <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's not what I want you to do. That's not where I want you to be. I want you to be beyond that. I want you to be mature. I want you to be grown, full grown. But for the time being, in the infancy of the church, there were people who says, well, this is what God wants. And then there was this other guy over here named Paul, and he says, this is what God wants. Who do you believe? They're saying two different things. Absolutely, absolutely, that, exactly, yes, because like if I'm there in the audience in the first century, and I see the a handkerchief that Peter had touched, or just the shadow of Paul touches somebody who I've known all my life, was crippled and could not walk, and all of a sudden he jumps up, his legs are just as whole as can be, and he can not only walk, he can run, he can dance, he can do anything that he wants, Guess what? I believe in Paul. No matter what he tells me, I believe in Paul. And that's what the miracles were for. But we see that there were times in which an apostle was not going to be around. And so it's uh, uh, you know, another interesting thing to me whenever he's writing to Timothy and he's writing to Titus. He says, whenever I'm not there, see that you give attention to the readings. That you give attention to the doctrine. He says, if there's anything else that needs to be set in order, I'll set those things straight whenever I come. But until then, you do what? You study the Bible. And so, little upon little, precept upon precept, we see that the Bible is given to get us to that place where God is talking about there in Hebrews chapter 8. Things that are written on your heart, things that are written on your mind. Where does it start out from? Again, it starts out from God the Father. He's given it to Jesus. He's given it to the Holy Spirit. He's given it to Paul, who wrote it in a letter to Timothy. It's been translated into a language that Chad can understand. How many of us have uh, 
you know, sat at a, uh, oh, I knew they were coming. <laughs> How many of us have, have sat in the audience or maybe you've sat at home at television and we're laughing so hysterically at something that's on the television that you can't breathe. You got tears running down your face. Sherry sometimes will be laughing at me because I'm laughing so hard. She's not laughing at what's on the screen. She's just laughing at how crazy I am. <laughs> now, how is it that that person that perhaps is doing this live, but perhaps not, uh, is able to make me laugh so hard that I can't hardly breathe, that I've got to stop and catch my breath? How is it that somebody can have influence over someone like that? Have you ever been somewhere where somebody has read a poem, perhaps at the end of a sermon, like I was here one time, and you have tears running down your face because you knew that that poem was, was so good and it fit so well with what was being said in the sermon? I can remember that with, with Maxie Bourne. You know, have you, have you heard something that just... Filled your heart with joy. The United States was at war, but we're not at war anymore. The war is over. You know, it's, it's those things that we see that God has designed words for. And so there is words that are spoken, but there's also words that are here on the printed page. And they go into my eyes, literally. They go into my ears, literally. But where do they land, hopefully? Well, they, they should land if, if Chad's doing his part. God's already done his. They should land on my heart. You know, they, they should be written in my heart, written on my mind. And so there is some in which God did work with, in miraculous ways. We talk about them, they're prophets and they're apostles. Would it be cool to be an apostle or a prophet? You know, I think it would, be, it would be good in some ways. The stonings, I'm not so sure. I don't know if I would like that too much. <laughs> but there were some things that they did just, you know, to be there, it would be, it would be amazing. But then there are things that we see in which God is just not going to work with, with us, you know, in that fashion. And he tells us as much in his word that he's going to give these to us in a series. Now here is the, the, the wind-up, you know, the what for, I guess. And I know I'm just about to run out of time. We're going to hear that second bell. There are some people who are looking for that pearl of great price. They know that it's out there, and they're looking for it. I know one man that became a, a gospel preacher. He was a New Testament Christian. He was a Jehovah's Witness whenever he grew up. He told me that he visited 28 different churches before he went to the last one that was right next door to his house. And guess which one it was? The Church of Christ. <laughs> and, and because of his diligence, you know, he kept searching for that pearl of great price until he found it. And then uh, there are some people who just don't care. You know, I, I hate to say it that way, but that's just the truth. They, they don't care. They, they feel fine. They're going fishing on Sunday, and they're really kind of unconcerned what you do at church. But if you interrupt their life, interrupt their, their series of, of, of things that they do and the way that they think, and just give them something new to think about, they realize that there's more to this life than just the here and now, and that there's a God in heaven who wants to have a relationship with them, not just here, but also for an eternity. And then they stumble upon that treasure that was in the field that they didn't know was there. How is it that God's message gets to them? And this is, this is the what for for this lesson. You know, why are we, why are we studying this? That's right. It's, it's all of us here. You know, God is expecting us to take his message that started with him. It's been, again, through the steps. <laughs> Jesus, Holy Spirit, the apostles, perhaps maybe a, a prophet that the apostles had laid their hands on, but they wrote it down in a book. And now it's inside of me, but it can't stay there inside of me. God wants me to go out and do what? Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Yes, yes. You know, go out and preach the gospel. Go. And so whenever you have opportunity to talk with people, uh, 
leave you with one little, uh, you know, last interesting thing that I've read. Just, just real quick, I'll give it to you. Whenever we look at why people come to church and why people stay at church, what do you think the number one reason is that people will come to the churches and that they obey the gospel and they'll stay with the church for the rest of their life? Number one reason. Because a friend or family member invited me. That's why. So just people that you know, people that you already see, you know, do your best to, to talk with them about God. And that keeps that chain going to them to get the, the gospel into their minds and their hearts. I thank you for your time this morning. I, I've talked way too much. You know, I've had a good, lot of good comments and, and a lot of good questions, and I appreciate you very much. I believe, uh, Tracy, Kevin will be back next week, right? Okay. Brother Kevin will be back next week, so y'all won't have to, to, to put up with me for right now. But maybe I'll be back one of these days. <laughs> Thank you very much. appreciate you. Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together. Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together.
Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together. Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together. Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together.
Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together. Welcome to the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We will be streaming live shortly. We stream on Sundays the devotional hour at 9 a.m., the classes at 10 a.m., and the worship service at 11. We also stream the worship service on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Now, let us worship our God together. It's time to get started this morning. I want to welcome all of you today. Glad you're here. If you are visiting with us today, please know that you are our very special guests. We're glad you're here today uh, and uh, want to invite you to come and join us whenever the opportunity comes your way. We're glad to have you. Always good to see our members. If you're joining us online, thankful for that. We're here to worship our God and honor and a privilege uh, to always do that. And um, we won't take any more time away from that. David Hamrick's leading our singing today. We'll turn the service over to him. Good morning. We'll sing these first three songs before the opening prayer.
Let us pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, we thank you for this and every opportunity where we are able to assemble together as thy people and to offer our worship and praise unto thee. We're so very thankful, Father, for this congregation, for her elders, for her deacons, for those who minister to her. We're thankful, Father, also for your church, for your word. We're so very grateful, Father. We are immensely blessed by you and to be your children. But we know, Father, that there are some of our number who are in need, some who are hurting, many who are sick and under the care of doctors and nurses. We pray, Father, that you'll bless them and restore them to us just as soon as possible, if it be your will. We're thankful, Father, for your son, we're thankful for the life that he lived, for the death that he died, 
and for the hope that we have only in him and through his resurrection. And it's in Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen. We'll sing the first three stanzas of Nearer Still Nearer before the Lord's Supper. chapter 27, 32 through 37. Want to read along with me? Matthew 27, starting in verse 32. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, 
They gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink, but when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put over his head the accusation written against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Let's pray. Our gracious and merciful, loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your Son and our Savior Jesus. And we ask that you would be with us now as we remember the perfect life that he lived and the example that he set for us to follow. That we remember the ultimate sacrifice that he made for us so that our sins could be forgiven. That we remember the pain and the suffering and agony that he endured for each one of us. And that we remember his resurrection and through which we have that hope of an eternal life in heaven with you. Be with us now as we partake of this bread which represents his broken body. That each one of us will reflect back on that time and, and will partake of this in a manner that would be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pray again. As we continue this memorial, Father, we now focus our thoughts on the blood that Jesus shed. As his hands were nailed to that cross and his body hung and, and the blood that poured from his body. We ask that you be with us now as we uh, partake of this uh, fruit of the vine which represents uh, his blood. The, the blood that washes us and cleanses us of our sins and makes us white as snow. Be with us that we'll partake in a worthy manner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We now have an opportunity to give back a portion of what uh, God has so richly blessed us with. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for all the material and physical blessings that you provide us with. It makes our lives uh, so much more enjoyable here on this earth. And we just thank you, Father, for, uh, for the homes that we have to live in, for the clothes that we wear, the food that we eat, the cars that we drive, for the talents and abilities that you blessed us with to be able to support our families and ourselves. We ask that you be with us now, that we will give back a portion of what you have so richly blessed us with, that we will do so with a cheerful spirit, and that these funds may be used wisely to support the works and the programs here at Brown Trail. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before the lesson, we'll sing a hymn that's new to us, this congregation. It's a text is a very old text, which I guess goes to show that this problem's been around for a long time. <laughs> Where Scripture reading before the lesson this morning will be James 4, James 4, starting in verse 1 through 12. <clears throat> James 4, starting in verse 1 through 12. <clears throat> what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? <clears throat> Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scriptures say, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell within us? But he gives more grace, therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy uh, to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. 
Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? There have been some very strange sounding wars in the history of the world. You ever hear of the War of the Stray Dog? Where's my dog? There he is. The War of the Stray Dog. Fought between Greece and Bulgaria that started when it's believed that a Greek soldier chased his dog across the border and the soldier was shot by the Bulgarians. Or the War of the Oaken Bucket, one of the classic battles of the world fought between the city-states of Bologna and Modena in northern Italy, where one accused the other of having stolen the oaken bucket from the well that both used. Or the Pig War, familiar with that one? Fought between the United States and Britain over an island off the coast of Vancouver. A lot of saber rattling in that war and it's called the pig war because the pig was the only casualty of the battle. (laughs) War is too often a fact of life. Despite treaties Despite promises, there always seem to be wars. In every generation, and on practically every level, if you were around as I was back in the mid-1980s, the Cola Wars... Well, you know, the church is not immune to that either. We have our fights. We have our battles sometimes. And the battles can be sometimes just as um, humorously named if they weren't so tragic. There's the you-didn't-like-my-idea war. There's the they-won't-let-me-be-an-elder war. Or the I-don't-like-new-songs war. And its companion, I-don't-like-old-songs war. James wrote to Christians who were mired in a bloody battle. But not a battle against the forces of evil, but a battle with each other. A battle within themselves. And a battle with God. We're studying the marks of Christian maturity from the book of James. We're working ourselves, those of you visiting today, we're just working ourselves through the book of James at these 11 o'clock hours. And we've come to chapter 4 today where we find this particular mark of Christian maturity and that is being able to lay down one's armor when necessary. 
that a mature Christian is one who refuses to fight when a battle is not called for. And so let's take some time this morning to to work ourselves through this text. We won't be able to do it in great detail. We'll hit the high points of it. And I think we'll have something there that will help us to gauge where we are on this spectrum of maturity as it relates specifically to these kinds of battles. And so let's first of all talk about the war that we sometimes have with each other. James asks the question in verse 1, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? And if you go down ahead of ourselves to verses 11 and 12, he references this battle with each other again. Do not speak evil against one another, he said. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. And there's only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to both save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? They were fighting with each other. Brothers and sisters ought to be able to live together and work together in harmony. We should be able to. Psalm 133 verse 1 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It's a blessed event and circumstance, but it doesn't always happen. You can read through Scripture and see how how people in families didn't always get along. Lot and Abraham had their differences. David and his son Absalom had major differences. Even the Apostle Paul and Barnabas had their differences. And so it happens. In the church at Corinth, there were members of the congregation taking each other to what we would call small claims court. Paul would describe it as the smallest of matters. They were also, some of them, fighting over assemblies and, and, and speaking time in the assemblies. They were, they were actually at each other's throats, practically, over who was going to get to speak when. In the churches of Galatia, Paul described brethren as biting and devouring each other. Galatians 5.15. In the city of Philippi, two ladies seemed not to be able to get along with each other. And Paul mentions them in the letter by name. Euodia and Syntyche. Wouldn't you like to have a write-up in the Bible? Wouldn't that be nice, right? Well, these ladies got one. Probably not what they were after. Paul encouraged them to be of the same mind. They they weren't, and he wanted them to be. Philippians 4, verse 2. Well, we come to James. And it seems that there were egos that had gone unchecked. Remember in our study last week, as we looked at the end of of chapter 3, how James talked about what true wisdom looks like and how it's not characterized by Bitter jealousy, verse 14, selfish ambition in your hearts. That's the wisdom from the world, not the wisdom that comes from God. And evidently, that's what they were dealing with. And these egos, this bitter jealousy and envy and and selfish ambition and all of that had spilled over into their relationships with each other. Hence the admonition or the question, what causes quarrels and fights? among you they were speaking evil of one another chapter 4 verse 11 where he tells them stop doing that mature Christians won't fight over petty things but they evidently were which leads to the question why 
Why were they at each other's throats? Why did they feel it acceptable to speak out against one another, to verbally lash out at each other, and to talk about each other in negative ways? Whence wars and fights among you? Well, the answer to that is our next point, and that is the war within ourselves. See, James answers the question, what causes quarrels and causes fights among you? Is it not that your passions are at war within you? Here's the problem. What so often causes the battles and fights with each other within the church is the fact that we are losing the battle within ourselves. We're losing the battle over our hearts. We've talked in our Wednesday night class here in the auditorium as we're studying through the book of Romans. And as we've come through chapter 6 and 7 specifically, we've talked a lot about how Paul describes that, that inner battle within each one of us between our flesh and our spirit the flesh and spirit warring against one another. And this civil war that takes place within each of us where we're pulled in one direction to obey God and there's always something within us pulling us in a different direction to disobey God. And it's, and it's a fight. And we don't always win. Well, James says that often what causes the quarrels and the fights between people is the fact that the people involved in them are losing the fight within themselves over their own passions. When selfish ambitions win the war against humility in the human heart, then we start fighting with each other. Selfishness leads to wrong actions. Look at verse 2. You desire. You lust. You, you want things. There's, there's desire in the heart. You desire and you don't have, so you murder. I don't know that they were guilty of literal murder, but doesn't Scripture speak of hatred towards a brother as murder? John said as much, 1 John chapter 3, verse 15. You're willing to engage in character assassination when you desire something, you want something, and you don't get it. So you resort to these other tactics to try to get what you want. You covet, again, verse 2, you covet and can't obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You're losing the battle in your own heart over your own passions and desires. And your passions and desires have become so important to you that in order to fulfill those, you're willing to sacrifice relationships. And so you bite, devour, hurt, fight, quarrel. Selfishness leads to that. Selfishness also can lead to bad prayers. Bad praying. Look at verse 3. You desire and don't have, so you murder. That's verse 2. Verse 3. You ask and do not receive, because you ask wrongly, so that you may consume it on your passions. Again, the motivation is uncontrolled inner passions. And those become so great in you that you go to God with them. But again, your motive is not the glory of God. Your motive is not the will of God. Your motive is only to get what it is that you want. Newsflash. God is not obligated to grant our every wish when those wishes are coming from a selfish heart. He's not, not obligated to do that, nor is he going to. And so James says, where do these fights and quarrels among you, among you people, where, where does that begin? Is it not because you're losing the battle within your own heart? 
Well, why were they losing the battle within their own heart? Point number three. Those that are at war with others are at war within themselves. And they're at war within themselves because they're at war with God. They're fighting God. A person finds himself at war with God when he becomes friendly with God's enemies. And James describes the enemies of God as the world, verse 4. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? What does he mean when he says the world, friendship with the world? Well, the Bible uses the word world in a lot of different ways. But here, it's a reference to those those influences that are a part of this existence, this worldly existence, that run counter to God's will. So the influences that are a part of our world that are are counter to what God would have us to do and be, that's the world. That's why John would say in 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world. He's not talking about the planet as such. He's talking about these influences. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust, here's desire, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the vain glory of life, those things are of the world. And this world passes away and the lusts of it. But he that does the will of the Father abides forever. When we become too cozy, with those things of this world. That puts us at enmity with God. To be carnally minded, worldly minded is death. Romans 8, 6. And so, when we're too cozy with the things of this world, we're at odds with God. How about the flesh? The world is God's enemy, so is the flesh. That takes us back to verse 1. Where these fights and quarrels come, is it not because you are at war with your passions within you? There's the flesh. We cannot let those things control us. Abstain from fleshly lust desires, which war, which do battle against your soul. 1 Peter 2.11. See, we have to fight those things. We're, we're not... We're not mere creatures of instinct where we just let whatever passion or desire pops into our head control us. We are to exercise control over them. Self-control, it's called, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, part of the Spirit's fruit. And those are things we're to put to death, Colossians 3, 5. But if we're too cozy with those fleshly desires, that puts us at odds with God. We're also at odds with God when we cozy up to Satan himself. Resist the devil, verse 7. God opposes the proud, verse 6. Pride is Satan's greatest tool. When we're dominated by pride, he's won the battle. That's why we're to resist him, steadfast in the faith, 1 Peter 5, 9. When we fraternize with God's enemies, we become guilty of adultery. Back to verse 4. You adulteresses, James says. Strong language. Don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity, strife with God? Why are you having such problems and difficulties controlling your passions within you? Because you're at war with God. You've cozied up to God's enemies. And because you've cozied up to God's enemies, you're losing the war within yourself. And because you're losing the war within yourself, now you're fighting with each other. That's how it all works. But as we try to wrap this up, let's turn from war to peace. How can we make peace with God. 
You know, if we can make peace with God, then that's going to affect the rest of it. We make peace, we stop fighting God, we'll be in a better position to win those battles against self, against our own flesh, and if we're winning that battle, we'll pretty much be at peace with others. So how do we make peace with God, enabling us to be at peace within ourselves and with others? James gives us these points. Consider them very quickly. Number one, submit to God, verse 7. Submit. Literally, get into rank. Recognize who's in charge, and it's God. When a buck private starts acting like a general, problems are going to follow. And if we start acting like the general in relation to God, problems are going to follow. Submit to God. Get back into rank. Resist the devil. Don't entertain him. Don't fraternize. Recognize how dangerous he is. Resist. Draw near to God. Instead of drawing near to God's enemies, draw near to Him. How do you do that? Well, cleanse your hands. Verse 8. Get your sins taken care of. Purify your hearts. Stop adulterating yourself by cozying up to God's enemies. Humble yourselves. Verses 9 and 10. Truly mourn over those wars caused by your own sins. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. Don't be satisfied living in an environment that is always in turmoil within yourself, with your brothers and sisters in Christ, with God. I wonder if some people haven't just gotten used to living in a world of spiritual chaos. They don't have peace, but they've gotten used to that. Humble yourselves. Blessed are they that mourn, Matthew 5, 4. And the mourning in Matthew 5, 4 is connected to poverty of spirit, Matthew 5, 3. Recognize how much you need God. And mourn over the fact that your sins hamper that relationship. Do that and God will lift you up. Do you need to lay aside the weapons? Do you need to stop fighting God? Let Him have control of your life? Maybe you do. If you realize you do, is there something we may do to help you in that battle? May we pray with you? May we study with you? Can we in some way open up the Word of God with you, help you to see what it means to be the mature Christian that God calls upon all of us to be? If we may help you in any of those ways, we invite you to come as we stand and sing together.
Good morning. Good to see everybody here today. Thank you for being here. Eddie, thank you for good lessons. Appreciate your study and your, your willingness to uh, communicate that with us. I want to thank you so much for being with us today. If you're visiting, a special, special welcome. We've seen uh, several of you here today, including uh, Jason and Carla. Uh, good to have you guys here with us. I think you said you're on your way to San Antonio, so you guys have a great vacation. Good to, good to see everyone. If you would, uh, if you would just remember to fill out the, the uh, card, the rack in front of you, fill that out and, and pass it the aisles or leave it and see, we'll, we'll pick those up here in a little bit. I'm going to go over just a few announcements. As, as you know, uh, just a reminder, if you haven't already done so, make sure and grab an announcement sheet at, at the back. It's going to have more than what, what we're going to go over. Uh, a lot of things to pray for here on the back. There's, there's several that we need to keep on our prayer list. Um, we're saddened at the loss of our brother Jack Johnson, who passed away March 16th, and we extend our condolences to Margaret, Michael, and Joy, and the rest of the Johnson family. The graveside service will be on Tuesday the 26th at 11 o'clock at Laurel Land Memorial Park in Dallas. Rhonda Ramsey has not been feeling well, and tests have determined that her cancer has returned. So let's remember to pray for Rhonda. Also, don't forget to sign up at the Information Center if you can help provide food for the Foster's Home for Children Senior Celebration and make plans to join us on Sunday, April 7th, as we celebrate this year's senior, Rosie Moffitt. So if you haven't already thought about this, please try to be here for that. We'd like to make sure we get a really good turnout and send off for, uh, for Rosie. If you'd like to adopt a Brown Trail School of Preaching student for this quarter, please sign up at the Information Center um, it's a busy day today. We've got uh, details in the bulletin regarding uh, the bridal shower for uh, uh, Maddie Cardenas, tonight's youth group devotional, other upcoming events, including a wedding. So it's a busy day, B busy afternoon. Let's remember to uh, let's, let's remember to keep all these all these items in prayer. If you would, why don't you stand with me? We'll have a we'll have a dismissal prayer. I'm gonna. I'm going to reference a scripture that Eddie uh, talked about in his 9 o'clock devotional, in Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Let's pray. Merciful Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your abundant mercy, your grace, your kindness, your patience, and your love for each one of us. Father, as we, uh, as we head out into this world and face the week tomorrow, we pray that you will bless us. Give us the strength that we need to live as we have been called. We pray, Father, that we'll be faithful and obedient to you, that you will instill in each one of us a deep desire to seek you as you would, as you would have to be found. We pray, Father, for uh, our, our service today, that it has been not only acceptable to you, but pleasing in your sight. We're thankful, Father, that you have blessed those in our number uh, that have had struggles, and we're grateful, Father, for, uh, for the progress of Gwen Woodard, and pray your continued blessings upon her. And for Judy Hatfield and the, um, the successful procedure there as well. We pray for Rhonda Ramsey that you may bless and, and be with her. Uh, Father, we're, we're stunned by the level of care that you provide each one of us. And we look to you, Father, for strength and for guidance and for direction in this life. We'd ask that you would pour into each one of us an enormous amount of wisdom that we may do right in your sight. Forgive us of our sins, Father. Help us to walk in the light uh, and have that continual cleansing through the blood of Christ. We pray all these things through Jesus. Amen.